So our story takes place in the Sierra National Forest. Uh, the sublocation is Johnson Meadows. Uh, Sierra, Sierra National Forest is 1.3 million acres, which is slightly smaller than the state of Delaware. So it's a pretty big area. Yeah, it's a big forest. And it's like in the middle of like tons of national parks and other forests. It's Yeah, it says it's uh, located in the western, western slope of the central Sierra Nevada. It's known for spectacular mountain scenery and abundant, abundant natural resources. I'm having a rough night around. <laughs> um, so what I'll do is I'll throw this up for our people viewing. Yes. No, I didn't even search it. We're still in Hawaii from uh, your Cal Al hike. So or- for those of you who only listen to the show, we, we also do a live stream of this. Uh, not live, live, but the video will go up on YouTube and we, we it's live show, to us. It's live to us. <laughs> um, and we show, you know, maps of the locations, pictures from the search, other relevant yeah. things that happen. So it's a little southeast of San Francisco to give you an idea uh, where this is located. So the forest shares borders with Yosemite National Park, the Inyo National Forest, Kings Canyon National Park, and Sequoia National Forest. Johnson Meadows is a very beautiful but isolated part of the Sierra National Forest, not a normal destination for casual hikers. So, as we said, it's in California. It was established in 1893 and sees roughly uh, a million visitors a year. It's like a million 50,000. So, a million Mm -hmm. visitors a year. That's a 2017's USDA report. Um, So, a history of the area. The Sierra National Forest has been home to Native American people for at least 13,500 years. This date is based on obsidian hydration analysis of Clovis Point, of a Clovis Point that was discovered in the upper reaches of Kings River watershed, a little above 8,000 feet in elevation. Clovis refers to a projectile point type as well as a culture, as well as the culture that produced them. So, the Clovis people were originally thought as the like original people of the North so, Americas. Uh, but I've been watching yeah, I was Graham gonna, Hancock's <laughs> yeah. special on Netflix, and yeah. I think there is very good archaeological <laughs> evidence that they were not the first people. Yeah, but it's. Uh, I'm only like half half away halfway into that episode. But I, I saw how excited you were getting yeah, when I, I said gonna, that. You beat me to the punch. <laughs> um, very interesting documentary, and uh, he had a, a podcast. He was on Rogan's podcast a while back, and... With uh, the other guy, I can't remember his name. Well, it's 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 Graham Hancock and Alan. Yeah, I don't remember his first name. But his it's interesting. Name I yeah. obviously Joe and I have no idea what we're talking. I about. I geek out on that stuff. You know, archaeology and it makes sense. It's to interesting. Me. It makes sense to me, which um, isn't a lot. But <laughs> but if it makes sense, it makes sense to me at least. But uh, this is the accepted uh, history of the area as of, as we know it today, yep. which maybe will change someday. Yep. Hey, they just <laughs> in the last ten years discovered William Shakespeare wasn't one person. <laughs> it was. It was you didn't know this? Uh, maybe I did. I don't hey, know. You look it up. William Shakespeare was like a conglomerate of different writers that wrote as the pen name William Shakespeare. Oh. It's like a group of people. Wow. So yeah, th- things change all the time as we learn more. Wow. Uh, so these early inhabitants. So right now we're going off of the uh, the the current accepted Clovis people were the first ones there. The early inhabitants. So they're commonly referred to as pale- Paleo Indian, a term which simply refers to as early Indian and encompasses a period of time from 14,000 to 10,000 years ago. So here are some interesting facts about the forest. No, the, these are, this is just forests. Oh, forests in general. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Sorry. Now we did one on national forests in a different episode and I didn't want to get the comments. Oh, that we people get so mad if they re- hear the same fact twice. We're just recycling. Yeah. Content. So here we go. Yeah. Which to be fair, sometimes people only listen to the new episodes. If they're new listeners, they don't go all the way back. So and some of the reviews of we it. get, I, f- I feel like they're probably listening to an episode from like two or three years ago. Yeah. And then they base the review on like, come back to us. Yeah. Check out some newer stuff. That's okay. We don't like those people. <laughs> uh, there's an ancient old growth forest uh, bordering Poland called Bielowatsa Forest. If I got that right, I'm going to type that in. Bielowatsa. That's what I'm calling that. Let's see. But it's Wiza. Bielowiza. Bio- oh, I have a piece of schmutz on my computer that is making it look weird. <laughs> Bielowiza. Bielowiza. All right. I have to go back to my thing. Forest. It resembles what most of Europe looked like before the 14th century. Uh, a man called Jadav Ping single-handedly planted a forest bigger than Central Park to save the Muli Islands in northern India from erosion. The forest is now home to large amounts of stray wildlife. One of the reasons your lungs feel refreshed when walking through a pine forest is because of an anti-inflammatory compound called a 
pinene found in conifers. It is used as a bronchiodilator in the treatment of asthma and abundantly present in marijuana. Peter Mayhew, uh, quote, uh, Chewbacca. He's the actor who played. He's the actor. He's the Chewbacca. tall, tall yeah. dude. Was required required to be accompanied by crew members who wore brightly colored vests while in the forest of the Pacific Northwest filming scene set on Endor, so as to not be mistaken for Bigfoot and shot. <laughs> I, told, I, I was laughing when I read yeah, that. <laughs> that would be that makes perfect sense that that would happen. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, there is a tree named Pando that is technically an entire forest. It is a uh, colonial uh, colonial colony of 4,700 aspens in Utah that all share the same root system. I remember reading about that in science class in yeah. high school. Uh, the New Jersey Forest Fire Service can summon any person aged 18 to 50 in their jurisdiction to help fight a wild for fire or for use of their property in assisting and it is a crime to refuse. The duties assigned require minimal training, such as digging trenches. Uh, Hurricane Katrina uncovered an underwater forest off the Alabama coast that is 50,000 years old. Uh, there is a 2,400-year-old giant honey mushroom in Oregon covering 2,200 acres, slowly killing off the trees in the forest. It is the largest living organism on the planet. So are they like just letting it go and watching it? Or I, I watched a documentary on a fung fungus, and I remember them talking about this. It's it's crazy. It it's like covers you know what they twenty two hundred acres, and they consider it a single organism. That's wild. Yeah. Uh, forest growth in the U.S. has exceeded harvest since the nineteen forties, and the USA has more trees now than any time in its past one hundred years. That's good to know. Yeah. Breathe a little easier. <laughs> uh, charcoal beetles fly into still burning forest fires to mate and lay eggs because competition and predators will be low. They sense distant fires using infrared armpit sensors. <laughs> that's crazy. You know someone dedicated their life to the charcoal beetle. Probably. And that's where we get this information from. They're just like, you know what? I'm going to do just charcoal beetles for the rest of my life. <laughs> that's, that's all they're doing. I mean, somebody probably. I'm not making fun of them. I'm saying that's great. There's probably a charcoal beetle PhD expert out there. Good. We need specialization. That's why we get cool stuff. <laughs> yeah. The western portions. Uh, this one's going to. We're now diving into the climate of Sierra Nevadas. So the western portions of the Sierra, Sierra Nevada region is characterized by a Mediterranean climate with cool, wet winters and warm, dry summers. The western portion of the Sierra Nevadas receives moisture and warm air from prevailing westerly winds off the North Pacific Ocean. And as air moves upward over the mountain range, air cools and moisture condenses into clouds and precipitation. Think Thus, of it like wringing out a, a rag yeah, full of water. It balls up in the mountains and just whoosh, dumps out. That's a good uh, analogy. I like that. <clears throat> Thus, the western mountainous portion of the Sierra Nevadas receives much more precipitation than the eastern portion elevations between... 5,000 and 6,000 feet on the west slope. And there's some of the wettest in the region. Now, the Sierra Nevada National Forest enjoys warm summer Mediterranean climate in accordance with our friends over at the Copen Cla Geiger classification I, system. I switched it up there on you. Yeah, I know. <laughs> it's a completely different building on the same campus, though. Yeah. <laughs> the yearly average maximum temperature in Sierra Net National Forest is 58 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, ranging from 41 degrees Fahrenheit in February to 81 degrees Fahrenheit in July. Annual rainfall is 43.5 inches with a minimum of 0.6 inches in August and a max of 9.1 in January. So the best months for good weather in the Sierra National Forest are June, July, August, and September. On average, the warmest months are July and August. The coldest months are February and December. And January is the rainiest month. So some of the terrain here, uh, it includes rolling oak-covered foothills, heavily forested middle elevation slopes, and starkly beautiful alpine landscapes of the High Sierras. The elevations range from 900 feet to over 13,992 feet. Wow, just short of a 14er, huh? Yeah. Uh, the highest peaks include Mount Humphreys at 13,992 and Mount Gab at 13,747. I would just go get like a 10-foot ladder. Right. right in the top of the mountain. And then yeah, and just, 14. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> or stack a bunch of rocks. Exactly. Uh, Bear Creek Spire at 13,726 and Red Slate Mountain at 13,140. Uh, 13, uh, some of the animals that you might run into are mule deer, 
black bears, coyotes, bobcats, fox, California mountain king snake, the western rattlesnake, mountain lions, marmots, porcupines, and quail. No grizzlies, I think. No, no. <laughs> no, we know there's no yeah, grizzlies. Yeah, you have, you have put that asterisk right there right away. <laughs> Uh, So sudden changes in weather uh, can catch many people unaware. Drenching thunderstorms can form in a matter of hours, and snow can fall at any time of the year. So you always want to be prepared for all weather conditions. Thunderstorms are frequent and a spectacular occurrence in the mountains. These summer storms often bring intense rain, hail, and lightning strikes, particularly in the mid to late afternoon, but can occur at any time. Is when they always say, get off the summits by noon. Yeah. Uh, plan to be over passes and away from high open areas by noon (laughs) during a storm. Stay away from peaks, ridges, caves, water, open areas, seek shelter. So don't be anywhere. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, you would think like, oh, I'd take shelter in a cave, but a cave could fill up with water. Oh yeah. You don't want to be in a heavy rain. Well, even if it doesn't fill up and water's rushing, it can push you back into it. Yeah. Just no good things. That's what happened in Zion. Yeah. Uh, by setting up camp in a safe location before lightning begins, you can enjoy the power and spectacle of mountain thunderstorms without apprehension. They are cool. Yeah. Good thunderstorm in the mountains is, is the most beautiful thing ever. It is kind of terrifying, though, too. It's extremely terrifying. When you, you hear that clap of thunder off in the distance, you're like, uh, it's time to get moving. Yeah, when you look around <laughs> above a tree line and you're like, well, there's zero cover. I have yeah. to get somewhere fast. <laughs> yeah. Uh, High water. So during spring and early summer, runoff from melting snow causes high water levels and swift currents in rivers and streams. We've said this a million times. Do not ford rivers if you do not know what you're doing and have stuff strapped to your body. Uh, Please remember that unabridged streams crossings may be hazardous. Cross in wide, shallow spot that is not above rapids or falls. Unbuckle your waist straps. Use long sticks for stability and face upstream while crossing. Uh, Never tie yourself to safety ropes. They can drown you. Water is very cold, so use caution uh, in those conditions because you can lead to hypothermia very easily, even on a sunny day, if the water is cold enough. Um, During or immediately following heavy rain events, water can rise rapidly, so use extra caution when these conditions are present. So it could be a small stream, but if it's raining, all of a sudden it can become a big swift current and take you away. Yeah. So let's talk about mountain lions. Mountain lions are shy and rarely seen, but they live throughout the area. You want to watch children closely and never let them run ahead or lag behind on a trail. Talk to children about lions and teach them what to do if they meet one. Never approach a mountain lion and do not run, but hold your ground and back away slowly. Face the lion and stand upright. Do all you can to appear larger. Grab sticks, raise your arms. If you have small children with you, pick them up. If the lion behaves aggressively, wave your arms, shout, and throw objects at it. The goal is to convince that you are not prey and that you may be dangerous yourself and they will back off. That's a big thing. You want to keep children in between you. If you have two adults, they should be bookends. Mm-hmm. Keep the kids in the middle. Um, other dangers include early season snow, tick-borne diseases, and giardia. You want to yep. get you know, don't don't want to get that. Drink clean <laughs> no. water. Um, so some tips to keep you safe: let someone know your itinerary, instruct them to contact emergency now, personnel if you are overdue. I know we kind of cover this stuff every episode, but I think it's just important to hammer home the safety tips. Uh, just so people, I think we've been saying it long enough that we may have staved off a couple of missing pe- people by now. That would be really cool. And I think uh, we'll I probably think we'd ever know. Yeah, we'll never know. Um, but I think just we want to say it enough that if you listen to the show every <clears> week <throat> and you're out hiking, you just like will think of these things. And, oh, crap. Joe and Mike said I better tell someone where I am <laughs> yeah, and like, then do it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, message us. Let us know where you are. Yeah. Call our voicemail. Tell yep. us. Call the voicemail. Put it on our hiking. face. Yeah. Tell the whole community on Facebook. That'd actually be a cool Facebook trend is everyone just lets everybody know where they're at. Yeah. All the time. Unless that you don't want people knowing where you're at. Yeah. Like then you're, <laughs> people know your like house is empty. And yeah. <laughs> so maybe, maybe don't do that, but tell loved ones where you're going there you go. at a minimum <laughs> yeah or us you yeah. can dm us yeah um so stay on the trail in addition to causing severe erosion and damage leave no trace hiking off trails increases the potential for injury and becoming lost because they might not look for you off trail yeah when hiking with a group tr- keep track of each other and wait for at all trail junctions do not split up most of the cases if uh 90 of them are people by themselves or yeah. leaving the group yep Always carry extra food and water and rain gear and warm clothing. If you don't plan on spending the night, assume you might have to. Yeah. That's one thing. I always carry more gear, and sometimes people who are not as savvy as Mike or I make fun of us for carrying more weight. But if we keep doing that, we should not have the problems that we talk about on a weekly basis. Yes. 
Uh, if you do become ill or injured on the trail and are unable to hike, send someone in your party or a passing hiker for help. Write down and give the messenger your exact location, age, gender, height, weight, and description of your illness, injury, in order to ensure the appropriate emergency response. And then you want to stay put. Yes. Don't try and get closer. Don't try and make it easier for them. Stay where you are because that's where they're going to say you were. I did a, a recently, I was on another podcast where they, uh, the host of the podcast had a uh, search and rescue expert in the field of like 30 years on. And for about an hour, we were talking about, we were talking about the Terry meter case, but he was going into a lot of the stuff we've talked about. And one of the big things is people will wander around after they were lost and it just, it hurts their chances of being found quicker. Yeah. Um, and sometimes is maybe the reason why they never were found. So yeah, it's, uh, you know, as soon as you know, you're, you're missing, uh, you're lost. The best bet is to, you know, in the immediate area, try to, you know, find somewhere where you can get some shelter, but don't keep wandering around. Yeah. Um, if you, if you, you really think you're yeah, lost. Odds are you're going to become more lost. Mm -hmm. And if you do become disoriented, disoriented, disoriented yes, <laughs> or lost, sorry, Mike, I had to, uh, attempt to fix your location using a map, compass, and landmarks. If you're unable to locate the trail, stay put. Use a mirror reflective object to signal for help. Any signal done three times in a series is a universal distress call. Uh, that's important to always bring a map with you. Yeah, like anytime we go hiking, we get those those waterproof, tearproof maps, and it's just good to have. And, and you can track your trail location, always check up where you I've are. I've said it a bunch of times, you know, a, a GPS can get broken, run out of batteries. A map can even get wet, torn. You can, you know, a compass really doesn't break. Yeah. And, you know, just go buy a compass and learn the basics of how, you know, go to your, uh, go to your local park and just practice navigating via yeah, there's tons of uh, material on youtube and, and i'll teach you how to read maps and compasses yeah and i mean if you have a compass and a map you know you're you're already ahead of the game from a lot of people that get lost yeah there's many times we've gone bushwhacking but with a map and a compass we don't get lost yeah you know exactly where you are all times and it doesn't matter <clears throat> so difficulty in general uh the sierra national forest spans all seasons people visit the forest for camping horseback riding swimming picnicking biking Pretty much all the stuff you do yeah. um, in the wildlife. So based on all trails, similar to other parks we've covered, Sierra National Forest has trails to accommodate every skill level. Um, all trails list over 124 top trails in the forest with 30 listed as easy, 60 listed as moderate, and 34 listed as hard.